we are being constantly showered with apparently new ideas across all spheres of life, including transport. One of these is the resurgence of so-called wireless technology for trams and trains. In Australia, we've seen this implemented in places like Sydney and Newcastle. Other cities are now considering taking this step, such as Canberra. Whether or not is a good idea is besides the point for this particular video, but what we are going to talk about today is its lengthy but often forgotten history. To start with, the idea of a wireless tram changes the way that electricity is provided to a rail-based vehicle. Throughout history and today, overhead wires are mainly used to deliver this, but wireless technology instead uses a large onboard battery. Today, as we transition to a zero emissions transport network and society, the electrification of all sorts of vehicles has become a very hot topic, and onboard battery storage has been sold by many as a new and innovative idea. But what if I told you that this technology was well over 140 years old, and had even been seriously considered for implementation in the world's largest tram network right here in Melbourne. This story requires quite a bit of background, so please bear with me. In essence, there have been three waves of interest and implementation of wireless tram technology. The first in the 1880s and 90s, the second in the 1910s, and our present day development as the third wave. So let's start with the first one. This was set in motion by Edward Julien, a Belgian electrical engineer, in 1881. He developed battery-powered tram technology that made it into production and generated a lot of interest around the world. This included Australia, where tramway companies from Adelaide, Bendigo, Ballarat, Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne all looked seriously at introducing the Julien trams. While Brisbane never went beyond applying for government permission, all the other cities did conduct trials. Sydney, Ballarat and Melbourne conducted their trials using a tram that was built in the UK in 1887 and then shipped to Australia. All three trials concluded with some success, but they also identified some significant issues. By far the biggest problem was that the batteries were too heavy and not powerful enough to make it up hills. This was the main reason later cited as to why they were not adopted more widely. The other main reason was that by the mid-1890s, the cost of implementing and running overhead wires had reduced to the point where this was far more economical than batteries. This was an especially important consideration at the time due to the depression. And so wires were the technology that was adopted across the country. Other than the short-lived operation of battery electric trams in revenue service in Bendigo between 1890 and 1892, there was no other operation of these trams at any significant scale in Australia. But this was not the end, of course, for the battery-powered tram. Many of you will have at least heard of Thomas Edison, who was an inventor and businessman from the United States. Among his many inventions were significant work on batteries. He worked for many years using his own and others' research, eventually coming up with rechargeable nickel-ion batteries in 1901. These were initially used for electric cars and were quite problematic in the beginning. But by 1909, Edison announced to the world his new version of the battery, which was, according to him, a reliable electric storage device that could also be used for tramways. He sold it as the battery of perpetual youth, due to its longevity and reliability. Successful trials were run on tram lines in New York and other places, and one even began operating in revenue service in March 1910, designed by the Federal Storage Battery Car Company. Edison was, if nothing else, his own greatest fan. He and his company set about aggressively marketing this invention across the United States and the world. Articles of somewhat dubious origin began appearing in the British and then Australian press of his quote remarkable claims, waxing lyrical of the amazing benefits that it would bring. These included reduced noise, costs and energy consumption. In Melbourne, this sparked particular interest. At the time, there was considerable debate on the future of the tramways. The state government had begun funding major reforms of tram operations and the various private companies that operated them, which eventually culminated in the nationalisation of the tramways in 1916. It was with this background that a royal commission was set up into this very topic in 1910. 
It was a huge undertaking, with the seven commissioners holding 84 meetings and travelling across Australia to hear testimony from hundreds of witnesses. Its proceedings coincided with Edison's development of battery technology that I mentioned before. In the final report, one of the Commission's key findings was recommending the rapid electrification of Melbourne's trams, which at the time were still operated using cables. It's a fascinating document in its own right that I'd highly recommend reading if you're interested. So they looked at the five systems of traction available at the time. These were railless traction, otherwise known as buses, which they did not consider suitable for congested urban areas, surface or stud contact, where power would be drawn from electrified studs set at intervals in the roadway, conduit systems, where power is drawn from a buried third rail in between the two wheels of the tram, overhead wires, which they ultimately recommended to be the most suitable technology, and of course, storage batteries. As we can see today, the commissioners considered overhead wires to be the vastly superior solution. They did not assess storage batteries to be suitable for a tram network, although they did see that there may be some niche applications for the technology in areas with low passenger demand. Their reasons for this came from their examination of existing systems and interviewing expert witnesses. One of these witnesses, Orlando William Brain, then electrical engineer for the New South Wales Government Railways and Tramways, explained that the considerable extra weight of the heavy battery means that a tram requires a lot more energy to move. This may be acceptable if there are not many people on the tram, but in urban areas it would be much more expensive and impractical, something that was also proven back in the 1880s and 90s. However, the Commission's findings, published in 1911, did little to dampen popular interest in tram battery technology, which was fanned by the international marketing efforts of Edison and his companies. Glowing endorsements and articles continued to be published in the press. In November 1911, a Mr. T. Jefferson Monk claimed that he would return from the United States bringing a car, truck and tram, all fitted with Edison batteries. He said that he wanted to do this to encourage their adoption in Melbourne, but this doesn't seem to have ever eventuated. Eventually, the excitement died down as it became increasingly clear that overhead wires were the far more practical solution. Some continued to use it for their own ends though, such as property speculators. One of these was Sydney resident AJ Farmer, who also happened to hold the patent rights to the Edison battery technology in Australia. He slowly bought up over 1,500 acres of land on the Yarra River, and then began trying to sell his big ideas for development to local councils and politicians. The cornerstone of his plan was a new tram line powered by Edison batteries. Unfortunately for him, this never went anywhere. This really spelled the end of battery-powered trams in Melbourne until the present day. Now we are seeing a huge resurgence in interest in battery electric transport in Australia. Hundreds of networks around the world have adopted or are planning to adopt this technology for trams and similar light rail vehicles. But, as with a lot of apparently new and innovative ideas, we often forget the lessons of history. Many of the things that we are talking about today, in all fields, have already been tried and tested before. These short memories mean that we lose knowledge and experience. It even gets to the point of erasing them entirely, with ill-considered press releases like this one from Alstom in France in 2007 claiming the quote, first ever onboard battery system, when the Julienne tram had already achieved this over 125 years earlier in 1881, also in France. It is always worth exploring new ideas and re-examining old ones. But we must also remember all of the work that has been done by those who came before us, and not be blinded by what seems shiny and new. Just like the overhead wires of the 1890s and 1910s, there may already be an easier, cheaper and better answer. We just have to go in with eyes wide open. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and would like to see more, please subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on future videos. Also feel free to check out my website at philipmalis.com. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.